Hi, Robin. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. We're so excited to have you here. And everyone, this is Robin McLean, the founder of Hello Period. And Robin is just starting her day uh, in New Zealand. Is that correct? It is correct. So I am on to coffee number two. Amazing. 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 Well, it's here. It's um, an afternoon in LA here. And well, we're excited to get to know you and your story and hear how you started Hello Period, how you got started in the industry. So take us back. Where did it all begin? And how did you get to your place now? Yeah, sure. Um, so we started in late 2017. Um, we re it really started without a, a plan. I just had um, terrible periods for most of my life and tried a menstrual cup and it really it helped in so many ways and I didn't know why I hadn't used one or had the opportunity to use one before so um, I talked to my best friend about it and then we started doing some research and we actually couldn't find a brand that we liked that we felt um, you know would convince other people to kind of you know ha give it a give it a try mm -hmm. um so then and also the, the one I'd used was I mean it was it was great for me but it, visually it wasn't appealing and, and there were sort of elements to it that I didn't love and so I thought um you know I think we could create a menstrual cup that really ticked all the boxes um in terms of comfort and design um, and also that looked cute and, and people laugh when I say that, you know, a menstrual cup, why does it need to look cute? No, it, it, branding but, is everything and design. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, across everything in life, we're drawn to something that, um, catches our eye and that, you know, that, that looks, I, I don't know whether friendly is the right term, but just, um, maybe not, uh, not not confronting and not um you don't want it to look like it might be challenging to use or something like right. that so and i think yeah, so it's almost really... seen like intimidating too because this is there's so much that is going on within like education of there's like new ways to handle period care too and it's not just um like cups and tampons and pads there's so much more to it from probiotics to like how you feel maybe it's messing up your sleep or your digestion so there's probably a lot of education that's going on in the space but did you yeah. feel like you were one of the the earlier people to dive into this whole it's almost like a new industry I know that's probably controversial but I feel like that you've opened up this whole gateway which has been waiting so many years to be discovered and fulfilled yeah, I think um, I think that's right. We we were one of the first brands to launch, and so in those early days, there was exactly that. There was a lot of um, education required, uh, and it's interesting to me because as we've grown, uh, the inquiries that we get have dropped because as we've grown, um, so has knowledge about sustainable period care, and I think. Um, people understand it more so much um, better than they did when we started. Mm -hmm. So I think as one of the early, early brands, you know, a key piece of what we did back then was to explain the benefits, to explain why you would want to make the change mm -hmm. um, and to kind of hold people's hand really as, as they tried something different. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people too are set in their ways or they, they might learn something from a friend or they might learn something from their mom and people are, people are used to routines, right? And trying something new and exploring something different it can be very intimidating to people. So going back to what you said about designing and branding, it's everything so that someone isn't intimidated to try something. Yeah, that's right. It really is. And I think that was a, you know, if we didn't have, if we hadn't established ourselves with a good looking brand and a fun brand in those early days, I don't know even whether we would be around now. I think it's so important um, 
and yeah, I guess we were we were lucky that our brand resonated with people from the from the very start. So how did you get started with marketing? Was it word of mouth? Were you going with retailers? Was it through yeah. social media influencers? How did oh, you yeah, get we that had no out? idea. We had no idea what we were doing. You know, we really didn't. We were just, you know, um, um, I can talk about it later, but my background was as a journalist and Mary uh, was a nurse. So mm-hmm. in terms of business skills, we had none. Um, and so we literally designed the cup and we you know got packaging that we liked it all came back to what we would we would personally purchase and that's kind of what guided our decision making in the early days we didn't um we didn't have a strategy we had no plans we had no spreadsheets we just had a real passion for what we'd created and you know it it does seem crazy now but I think if we'd done too much um research and and thinking about it I don't think we would ever have started Mm -hmm. so so we launched you know this is pre-COVID and so we you know we when we first when we first got started I took all the photos of the cups on my phone it was really basic and Mm -hmm. there was no you know chuck a flower next to it and you know there was you know it We've come so far in terms of um, you know, social media and design and, and all the things that are helping small businesses in the last few years. There, I don't need, I don't know when Canvas started, but you know, there, I wasn't aware of anything like that to kind of help small businesses make their posts look slick. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, it was very ad hoc. Um, I I look back on those early posts and I just cringe. They're just so, you know, they're so very, very basic. Well, don't they say that if you don't look back and cringe, then you're not growing and that's the worst thing of all. So if you're growing, then it's it's best. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, also the really big difference back then was um, there was not really much competition, uh, not just in our category, but um, online. So Mm -hmm. you could put a few dollars behind a post on Facebook and it would go nuts. You know, there was none of the, you know, Meta didn't exist. Um, TikTok didn't exist. Uh, it, it's just, it was so simple um, and so simple to uh, get noticed. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, all that really changed um, with COVID when, you know, all the businesses that didn't have uh, webs, you know, like it's crazy to think that some people, some businesses were doing fine without really even a website or definitely right. no um, ability to shop online. Um, we didn't need it mm-hmm. as, as much then. But as soon as, you know, as soon as COVID hit, everyone went online and everything changed and that got more challenging. Mm-hmm. And especially things that you still need. It's like not so, I'm sure, like the same way makeup kind of saw a dip because people weren't wearing as much makeup. It's skincare, everyone said oh, I'm looking at myself in a Zoom and I'm noticing these wrinkles or, hey, I can finally do that sheet mask at night because I'm not commuting home. So skincare saw that rise. So I think within the whole market of like menstruation, period care, like female health, there was, that's not going to stop during COVID and e-commerce is booming. So did you see that as a direct impact on Hello Period and almost like a bonus during COVID? I think what happened there was that people were more, because they're at home, they were more willing to try something new because they weren't going to, if it didn't work or if it leaked or something like that, they they were in a a safe space for them. Uh, So we definitely saw a growth um, in sales over that period. I look back on it now and think maybe we didn't tap into it quite enough, but I think Mm -hmm. it was a really interesting time to be in business because we we felt very empathetic towards the businesses that were really doing it tough. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, there was so much sadness over that period and I just, yeah. it was actually really hard to celebrate success um, in an environment where there were so many um, businesses that, were no longer viable and shutting Mm -hmm. their doors. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. This definitely was a strange time because it's like people are sick and they're suffering and people are dying and 
then people are losing their jobs or businesses are going under. But on the flip side, so many businesses started or were able to grow because of COVID. I mean, just look at the plastic industry as a whole, like that could have fell much before its time. And then the plastic dividers and grocery stores and um, retail shops, there's some businesses that probably made more money in the year than they had in a lifetime. So yeah, you know, even, even beyond e-commerce, but yeah. well, let's go way back to the beginning though, that how did a journalist get started launching a business? And so how did that all begin? Yeah, well, we just, I think probably my journalism background helped in terms of being able to write, um, you know, a, a, a website in social social copy that, that was in plain language, that resonated with people, that was a little bit fun. Um, so I found that segue into kind of running the marketing for the business pretty easy. And I think for Mary, she was a nurse, and so she was really... Um, you know, instrumental in making sure that we, everything was as high a quality as, as it could be and that we could really talk um, to the anatomy correctly and mm -hmm. the benefits and also really great at talking to customers who had specific questions and, um, you know, about inserting and, yeah, but it definitely was a big shift in career. Uh, but I think maybe what draw, drew me to journalism um, was being able to talk to people every day about about things and um, and I like meeting people and I think you get that that same opportunity in business mm -hmm. um, you know we I still read uh, most of the emails that we get in from customers because I want to make sure I'm always in touch with them and we're um, you know, your customers are, are your lifeblood. So mm -hmm. I think my curiosity, my journalism curiosity will always, always be there. And I think that's a, that's been a benefit for the business. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge has been um, things like numbers. No, journalists are notoriously um, uh, not great on numbers and uh you know, if you, I still get chills when I see a spreadsheet. Um, it's just. But I'm sure the same way someone gets chills when they have to write a, a, a homepage, you know, welcome here or product description or just pitching client or a sales email or reaching out about a partnership. A lot of people see that blinking cursor on a Word document and they freeze. And so. Yeah you have the skill that that so many people don't have so yeah. it's always do you feel like you can really empower people to say i'll outsource maybe accounting or sales projections and pricing to you knowing what skill sets you have or how do you delegate everything and knowing what's your strength and what you can focus on what you need to outsource yeah i think um six years down the track i'm still learning um learning that and i'm still learning that I can't, you know, you can't do everything. Um, and yes, we've absolutely started outsourcing uh, more, which for the stage we're at is so great. It's really allowed us to um, be a small team um, and, and the, the team can focus on growing the business and they're kind of um, the mechanics uh, we outsource. So we now outsource... Um, the you know we have we have someone who assembles our products and ships them for us rather than having an office where we we do the distribution ourselves um and i think learning that you know i wouldn't have known what a 3pl was or mm. distributors were or you know this the the business world i you know i had paid no attention to it whatsoever so i've really had to learn um on the fly as we've needed things, and we've made some, we, you know, we like, we've made some mistakes. Um, but I, you know, as again, as the saying goes, you, you do need to make mistakes to kind mm -hmm. of also be able to celebrate the wins. Mm -hmm. And to like live through when you when you go through a mistake, you're always going to remember that, and you might not remember the wins as much sometimes, but 
those mistakes teach you lessons, which might prevent a bigger mistake down the road. And I truly think that your experience as a journalist, you're able to have, like not only bring that curiosity, but you're also able to search and discover and research. And that is so important when you're starting a business because there's so many different paths you have to go down. And like, no one is an expert at everything at the end of the day. Yes, there are people that come from maybe a more like data science background and they're into the numbers and someone's more into manufacturing and the operations while someone has might have like been in that industry and they're rebranding it per se. But either way or any of those routes, you have to discover all the things you've never learned before or find someone who can you can onboard and learn from. So I, I think your mm -hmm. your journalism background is actually like a huge part of your success. Yeah, I think also you have an ability to sense bullshit a lot um, mm -hmm. more um, as a journalist. And I think it it's so hard to navigate um, who's really wanting to help your business and who's the, the, the space where, you know, I get, you just get all the spam emails from people wanting to, you know, do this and do that and help accelerate your growth. And, um, you know, it's really hard to know. Probably in there there's someone who's actually genuine and not not mm -hmm. sort of a bot. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, most of them you just have to hit delete. It's um, a challenging space to find genuine support. That's why I'm quite um, – I'm a big fan now of actually meeting people um, – rather than doing business solely online. Mm -hmm. You get a better sense. It's true. I mean, and there's so many, like what you were saying too, I think with e-commerce and how e-commerce is booming, there's so many businesses that have grown out of e-commerce and, and even just looking at AI and how much of AI has pivoted into this e-commerce space. So right now yeah. um, you can transcribe your recorded calls and you, you can turn it into SEO and that's going to drive business to your page. It's all about splicing videos and getting the best like extracted moments from them to put up as digital ads on Meta or TikTok um, or like changing the language between TikTok and Instagram. There's so much that has developed out of this almost like gold rush of e-commerce that really blossomed during COVID with these mm -hmm. new businesses. And, and yes, they are pitching like crazy, whether they're bots or real people and they're the... Mm -hmm the 2023 version of the traveling salesperson from the 60s so yeah and just in a, a higher capacity and scale yeah yeah so how is how do you oh sorry go ahead no you go i was gonna say looking at hello period how do you look at taking a brand to starting it to growing it to expanding it how do you know when you're pushing the envelope too far and how do you know when you're not taking enough risks that you need to accelerate to get to that next level? And like, do you follow it through your intuition? Do you have a mentor? Like, what is your path and route there? I think um, we've always been driven a lot by intuition. Um, and again, it comes back to just staying true to ourselves um, as a brand and, and following things that we like or would like to know. Um, I think there's a there's a huge danger in rushing rushing your brand um, because people notice that, and I think rushed brands look like they probably don't have much thought behind them. Mm -hmm. So you know that I think there's been a lot of talk recently about celebrities endorsing certain brands or coming out with their own brands and I um and, and that's really hard for smaller businesses who've spent so long trying to do something they genuinely believe in and then you get someone who's got a name who slaps their slaps that name on the side of a bottle of vitamins or something and um and, and kind of cuts into the market um but I don't I mean, my hope is, to me, they never seem like, they, they're, nev they're never something I would endorse or buy long term because mm. I, don't, I don't, I see 
what's happening, you know, and, and what's happening is they're looking to make more money. Mm-hmm. They're not, I, and I think when we started, we never, we never knew the future. We didn't start our business to make money. We started our business because we wanted people to experience the change that reusable products had pr- given us. And mm-hmm. I think, um, and that desire still remains. I, Mary and I both had teenage daughters when we started the business. And, mm-hmm. and I think that was a big driver because we, we wanted them to have the choice that we never had when we were growing up which is, you know, we, we would never say you have to use a hello disc or a, a hello cup or a underwear or whatever to anyone. But what we do want is to be able to be there as an option for people. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, if, if people choose to use tampons or pads, it's 100% their prerogative. What we can do is say, you know, really those products have had no innovation uh, forever um, and we've done something that we believe is more comfortable will save you money and you know so it's it's um, but whether you choose it, it mm-hmm. you know that's completely up to you and whether it's right for you again it's that's mm-hmm. up to you so I think um, you know we, we're not we're not we're never going to be out there going buy us buy us buy us we, we're just like we're here Mm. We try, in our messaging, we try and be kind of more like a conversation that you'd have with a best friend. Mm-hmm. Um, it's colloquial, it's ask us anything you want to know and um, and let's see if we can help you with any fears you have about making the change, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, you know, the best thing we can do it is a, as a brand is, yes, we want to reach as many people as possible, but um, our biggest advocates are our, are our customers. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially with a product like this, I think, you know, it, it's it's got to be good. And mm-hmm. so our customers will tell their friends if it's something that works for them and and they trust those people. You know, I think mm-hmm. we we live in a world where we're just inundated with advertising. So, um, and brands can go under um, wasting too much money on trying to stand out in a market. You know, I think you have to really look at who you um a targeting and even the whole influencer market you know that's changed hugely again it boomed over covid and Mm -hmm. now it just feels so false Mm -hmm. um we've never been hugely into using influencers anyway we've we've always said we will if we're working with someone um in a paid way um either it's contra or um if if we're using someone as an ambassador, they have to be used. They have to be using our products yes. and, and genuinely like them. Mm-hmm. We don't want someone who's going to um, talk about us one week and then talk about how she loves using tampons the next week. Yeah. You know, just it, it's so. Or if they um, have even like a, um like a female centric audience that they're saying that they're educating on female health and like personal care. And they're giving real advice that might be not was always like widely spoken about. That could be such an organic audience versus someone who's talking about contouring their face and making their favorite, you know, recipes. And that it's not an organic transition into what they're selling. And mm-hmm. although there are amazing platforms to connect with such a direct audience, I agree. There's many times where we see people recommending two competing products and we're wondering what do they actually use? Or is this the product that's right for me? So that's smart of you. Yeah, that's right. And 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 then you know, the brands look stupid, and the, and the mm. influencer looks stupid because yeah. it just shows that they're not in it. They're not promoting things they believe in. They're promoting right. um, products that will pay them money and mm-hmm. to say they like them. So it's just, yeah, it's it's not a, an area that we're interested. So in. You can get referrals though. Referrals are the best thing, right? Because it's it's free marketing and it's the most genuine marketing. If someone's saying, I really love this, 
and so should my sister or my friend or my colleague. That is, it's such a direct path. And yeah, that can really just like grow your business so naturally. Mm. Yeah. But that is, that's rare. Referrals are, are becoming more and more rare because they're saying that like years ago, right? They said like maybe in the 90s, especially with like personal care, whether it's anything from a detergent to blush, people would probably ask their mom or their best friend and the mom uses this detergent, so they use this detergent. And then the kind of the millennial to Gen Z had this transition of they wanted maybe to use the opposite of what their family was yeah. using. And then now your access to the world is so far beyond your classroom, your office, your neighborhood. Yeah. You can ask someone on the opposite side of the world what they recommend because maybe you relate to them and their their lifestyle. So yeah. it really is, it opens new doors. but. It really What's does, and, and, and that's the crazy thing, you know, that the world has become, you know, exploded when it comes to brands that are available in each category. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I was last in the States, I was at Whole Foods walking down the island, walking down the water aisle, and I was like, I'm so pleased I'm not in the water business yeah. because... You know, there were all these amazing brands and they'd all got beautiful um, marketing and, 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 and graphics on the cans. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really survival of the fittest. And, okay. um, you know, within six months, I would imagine that a lot of those brands won't exist because, you know, it's water in a can. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think, it's great. It's great for us to have choice as consumers, but I think what for me is really frustrating is, you know, there's this huge piece where we are destroying our planet mm -hmm. by, by, by this sort of rampant consumerism that's going on. And um, I always think uh, I'm more and more a fan of buying mindfully and, um, you know, don't don't rush into purchases, and, and you know, it's just like if you're going to buy clothing, buy something that you think will last more than a week. And yeah. um, you know, that it goes across everything. You know, do you do do you need packaged water? You know, everything, mm -hmm. every choice we make has an impact on on the planet. And you know, we're seeing this crazy stuff going on. Um, with climate change, yeah. and it feels like it's just gone up to a real level this year. Definitely, uh, definitely and it's a lot of scary. weather changes. It is very scary, yeah. and it, it's all over the world too. So it's yeah. definitely a Mother Nature giving us a a sign of things have to change. Yeah, totally. And you know, in businesses and products that we're producing, we all have a massive role to play. Mm -hmm. um, in you know you can't say to someone don't start a business mm -hmm. but I think uh if I was to go back to the start six years ago I would be very mindful of the impact of that our business has mm -hmm. and I mean we're lucky because what we do uh, we're a truly sustainable business. We've been B Corp for many years, but I guess we yeah. exist to um, solely reduce people's reliance on single-use period products and, mm -hmm. and offer them something that lasts. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of greenwashing that's going on with businesses trying to sort of say, oh, yeah, I use this. It's made from X amount of recycled plastic. And, you know, what's better? virgin mm -hmm. or recycled you know there's there's just all so many debates but yeah. what's what's best is less <laughs> less of everything yeah whatever makes the least impact on our world yeah. yeah so how do you deal with competition there's so much competition within the space whether it's a more traditional competitor or someone who's also sustainable maybe they're not truly sustainable how do you navigate and there's so many brands coming into this space how are you navigating mm -hmm. competition or do you not even see them as competitors? No, I don't see them as competitors. I, the good ones are friends mm -hmm. um, and welcome in the space. The ones that are producing 
crappy products made from inferior, inferior materials. I hope that, um, again, with the ability to research brands and really look into the brand that you're buying from, I, you know, I, I hope that consumers uh, make the right choices in the space. And, you know, there's some, uh, there's some fantastic brands in the sustainable period world. And, um, you know, absolutely, I, I, we welcome all of them because at, at the end of the day, there's a lot of vaginas in this world. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, the brands that I admire in our space also are, have the same mission. You know, they, they just want to make period care better and more sustainable. And, mm. you know, we can work together collaboratively and, um, and help educate people about making the change. Um, the brands that have single-use products, again, some of them um, are in it for the right reasons because it will take a, it will take a few, you know, a couple more decades, I think, until we make that change. But I, I believe that um, in probably twenty years' time, I don't think you will be able to buy tampons and single-use pads. Yeah. There's no, there's no reason for them to exist. Um, they provide no benefit. They are expensive over time. They they're destructive to the planet. You know, there's just there's no yeah, there's just no reason for them to be here other than they're here currently because of habits that mm -hmm. this generation have. Mm -hmm. But but the generations that are coming up, you know, and they're, and they're our biggest customers, they know. They know that they don't want to do any additional harm to the environment. They mm -hmm. know, want to know what they're putting in their bodies. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's a lot of um, places, a lot of countries around the world that have no regulations when it comes to labelling of single-use period products. So, mm -hmm. you know, tampons and pads, they can contain chemicals. They can, you know, they, they're these things. You're bleach. putting them in a really sensitive pet bleach. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, you're putting them inside a, a part of your body that's very... Mm -hmm. um, uh, absorbent and and sensitive so yeah it's um it's it's interesting and we actually got approached by an investor who wanted to come on board as uh with our business and but he said he said to me uh i will only invest if you start doing tampons and pads and i was like no I that that's we why we started this business right. we're never going to we're never going to have single use products as part of hello period because mm -hmm. um, it is all and, about and sustainability of, and it's like not only what's good for you but what's good for the environment and if it's not meeting right. both those criteria then it's not in your brand mission yeah. yeah and he was like well i don't get it because you could produce a product that people have to buy every month and i was like well you know when we didn't we didn't start this business to, um, you know, be able to buy private jets and fly around the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know. We started to make a difference and not only for yeah. women and for the planet and the longevity of the world that we so graciously get to live in. And maybe he doesn't understand because he's a man. He doesn't have to deal with it. He never, yeah. it, it's, it's, so, it's such a foreign concept to a man. And I think that is something that, yeah we're all kind of working through um, yeah. makes us stronger at the end of the day can handle more in life. Yeah. You can go on that forever. Um, but like, so, so props to you for saying this is how we started and maybe someone's dangling cash in front of you or, Hey, we can ramp up your marketing or we can bring on an operations team or we can open this distribution and we can go so global, but props to you for saying, this is my mission. This is what, I wanted to start out with Mary and I'm going to continue doing it and stay true to my vision. So mm. that's pretty rare. Yeah. Very rare these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is next then speaking on an interesting segue into that, what is next for yeah. Robin and hello period? And what are you focusing on um, in the next few months? Or years? Interesting. We, um, well, last year we introduced several new products. So where we are now is we're the only 
sustainable period care company in the world that has a product for everyone. So when we started, we were just Hello Cup and mm. we were called Hello Cup and, you know, we were a one trip pony. But what we realised soon after launching was that, you know, we we wanted everyone to have a really reliable, sustainable period care option. And not everyone uses internal period products. Mm -hmm. So last year we launched um, Hello Undies, so period underwear, um, Hello Pad, which is an amazing reusable pad. Um, we also introduced specialist menstrual cups for different cervix heights. So we have a menstrual cup for, a, for high cervix and also for people with a low cervix. And then last year we also introduced our Hello Disc. So now we, we've kind of got the whole spectrum covered. Wow. The next, I think the next couple of years is just really bedding that in. And um, we, in New Zealand and Australia, really the focus for us is to continue to mainstream what we do. Okay. And and I think that's, that's happening. And, and, you know, the US was probably the, the first country that I was aware of to really understand sustainable period products, which mm. I found really interesting because, you know, you actually get a bad rap. Oh, no, and that's not the first time I've heard that. So <laughs> the kind of the, that, again, it's, you know, that rampant c consumerism. Consumerism and like um, single use and use and abuse. Yeah, but, you know, like to, to give credit where credit's due, um, some of your biggest retailers over there, Target and, and, and um, CVS, and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they've had um, menstrual cups on their shelves for, you know, a good few years now, menstrual cups and menstrual discs. And, um, and that's, you know, I think retailers have a really big part in helping us to mainstream and normalise uh, sustainable uh, period care use. So, you know, I, th I think I think that's great. And in New Zealand, we're in supermarkets and um, pharmacies, and the same just is happening with our products in Australia. So for us, the next few years will just be con really continuing on with with what we're doing and um, and growing. So the, the that growth piece is just um, you know not rushing it, but um, doing it carefully and doing it well and doing it. Uh, in a way that we never lose touch of our customer. So mm -hmm. we always want to be able to have personal conversations with anyone. And Do you um, find that you're selling mainly through your direct-to-consumer site or are the retailers that most strategic route to connecting with that end consumer? Yeah, we're about half and half at the moment. Um so again, COVID threw that big curveball where we we pre-COVID we were about 50-50 as well. COVID, you know, a lot of our retailers closed. We we're in a lot of smaller, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, hair salons, spas, um, as well as design stores, mm -hmm. and um, and they just never reopened their doors. And so, you know, for that first year. Post COVID, we were still um, probably about eighty percent uh, direct to customer, um, and now I think buyers are being given a bit more free reign, and there's a lot more uh, confidence starting to happen with with retailers again. And mm -hmm. so yeah, we're back up to um, fifty. 50, I think probably over the next 12 months it will shift and we'll have more more of a retail presence than online. Um, so yeah, it, that's exciting. As long as as long as people can find us, that's all that matters to us. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Robin, it sounds like you're doing incredible things, and I love that you're staying with your mission and you're staying on track and staying true to the root of why Hello Cup became Hello Period and where you are today. So I know we're running out of time, but I'd love to end with one more question. And that is, what is the best advice you've received and you want to share and why? Whether it's um, 
founding a company, whether it's personal, whether it's just macro career advice, what advice would you love to share? Um, I think there are, I think it's, and it sounds probably a bit cheesy, but, um, you know, things get better. There would, there's definitely, there's definitely been days when, um, I felt like giving up and, you know, it's, it's business life is really fun and great, but it's also, you know, there's, and things that just happen that, um, you know, really, uh, floor you. And I think sometimes, you know, there's, there's been times when I've just gone, oh no, it's, why would I, why would I put myself through this? It's easier to be an employee um, than be a founder. <laughs> and, but then the magic happens and you get an email from a customer and they're like, you've changed my life. And then it's back on. So it's just. And it's you know, all the, worth the it. Days, you can there's always light. Life for the better, then that's worth it all. All the, the strenuous, you know, unpacking, boxing to, to all the emails, the late nights, the early mornings, the pitching retailers, the spam emails, it's all worth it in the end when there's that one it person. It really is. You did it. It really oh. is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that is incredible. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for sharing your founder Thank story you. and sharing Nothing more about Hello Period. Where can people find you to connect and where can people find Hello Period to learn more or shop? Um, HelloPeriod.com. Uh, they can shop online. We post to most countries around the world. And me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and we are on, as our business, we're on Hello Period Co. on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Perfect. We're everywhere. Amazing. Well, Robin, we're excited to see Hello Period expand. And thank you so much again for sharing your story. And have a good rest of your day and thanks Thank so much you. for taking time on your busy schedule and congratulations on all of the success and really building a, a genuine, authentic brand and business. Thank you so much. Lovely to chat. Lovely chat too. Have a good one. Bye Robin. Okay. Bye.